15th. Hello, everybody. All right. Uh, oh, wow, we got some people showing up here already very quickly. So thank you very much for uh, jumping on today. Look, I know that there's there's a lot of um, uh, a lot of fervor and excitement and even dread or concern. Dear sister Paulette, she's here. Everybody, please say hello to our wonderful moderator here at We Are the Overcomers, Paulette Rose, and and I'm just so grateful, so thankful for her. But I also want to, to take this moment for all of us to pray, not, not just for uh, Sister Paulette, but there are so many people, and this relates to what I was uh, just talking about, and I want to allude to the fervor surrounding the uh, Ring of Fire eclipse that happened, and there, there was just this huge amount of excitement around this being the most important, uh, most uh, uh, high watch day ever in the history of high watch days, right? And I agree with that, but for a different reason. So for those people and that are looking at this and they're so disappointed and, and not because we are disappointed in God. I think it's because we were probably more disappointed in ourselves. What did we get wrong? That's what it is. We, we find all these things. We see all these wonderful things, right? And uh, Penny notes here, it was a nothing burger here in North Texas. Penny, dear sister, it was not a nothing burger. And that's what I want to tell you. It is so, I've mentioned this on several other messages before. There are warnings for a coming event, okay? Warnings for a coming event. I, I, I really kind of cringe. Brother Mike there at Repo Man 64, he talks about how when he hears someone talk about the first sliver of the moon, it's like scratching nails on a chalk mark. <laughs> you know, that, oh, I know what he means, but I get the same type of sensation when I hear about, well, right at this moment of time on this exact minute, that's what's going to uh, happen. And this is what uh, is going to take place and that's when the rapture of the bride is going to take place. And I am saying that while it is a high watch time period, I, I take more of the approach from our brother at uh, uh, Crowing Rooster Prophecies. Uh, he, that's his YouTube channel. And he's saying that this is probably or has been, since it's past now, probably the lowest watch date ever. And, and I tend to kind of agree with him from this standpoint. I just don't feel like it's actually going to take place at on the exact moment that we see these. What we see these, and it's good to look at it, it's good to identify all these things. Brother Patrick over at Rapture uh, 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 Hourly Watch, Rapture at Hourly Watch, I think is his new name. And, uh, and he's pointing out, he's pointed out some wonderful signs in the heavens and they are coming like a meteor shower. It is incredible, okay? But I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, I love you dearly. I really do. And I'm asking for you to hold on because I've got some words for you today that's really going to, oh, Holy Spirit, yes, thank you, is really going to make you feel more encouraged for this 
eminent, or should I say, rather than using the word imminent, impending rapture of the bride, okay? There have been so many people, and that's why I mentioned uh, Sister Paulette, uh, our, our, our dear sister, Rebecca Smith. Uh, uh, Becca, I, I just, I feel for every one of us need to come together and we need to be able to hold together at this moment. There's a reason for this. And I'm gonna go ahead and point this out too. I received an, an email from uh, our dear sister, Jenuka. Okay, and I'm just going to read you part of what she has said because I think that there's going to be uh, a lot of this similar type of feeling that's going to come about. Now, uh, Brother Laurie, I see that you're talking about being deceived by Satan with the calendars, and there is some of that as well. But I think also well-meaning watchmen and watchwomen are trying to pinpoint uh, a spot in the target that I, I think is unfair and falls outside of the scriptural context. By that I mean I don't find anything in scripture myself. Now, if there is, I'm not claiming that I know all or anything like that, okay? Of course, I'm as infallible as anyone else. And I am trying to be able to teach and, and to inform and to watch as Holy Spirit is empowering me and giving me the wisdom to do so. But it's a progressive revelation. And this is according to God's wisdom. He is not giving us all of this information at one time. He is not about to say, all right, guys, at 153, notice how I use that 153, right? Rapture fish. Uh, at 153 p.m. Central Daylight Time, whatever, or Standard Time, or whatever, any particular thing, he does not say that. If you will look at scriptures where things take place, they occur within a watch. They can happen within a day or a year or something like that. But it all comes down to within the hour. So I don't see anything that's actually pinpointed to the minute. Do you understand what I'm saying? And there's a reason for that. I want you to see that because we're supposed to be looking and watching for our beautiful bridegroom, Jesus, to show up in the clouds and call us up, okay? And I just have this feeling that where what, what's going to happen is that if God was to do that and just stamped it, then we're going to have this. So you could actually turn to page thus and such and say, as we hear often, it is clearly written right here on this page, that's when this is going to occur. And they, along with many, many other people, will never read a single other scripture. Case in point, how about the mockers and scoffers whose one scriptural reference that applies to anything. I've got to wash my car today. Oh, yes, no man knows the day or the hour, however, okay? You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that in jest. I love you, brothers. I love you, sisters. But that is, I believe, the wrong approach to the scripture, taking it out of context to try to dissuade your other brothers and sisters. If you are, in fact, a brother and sister, rather than working for the enemy in sheep's clothing, and you are trying to dissuade uh, other folks from reading the word of God, from understanding, from getting to know Jesus personally in your hearts, from his word, letting Holy Spirit to be able to impart 
a rhema word to you, a deeper understanding of that scripture and getting us closer. That's what this little uh, progressive revelation is for, I believe. No man knows the day or the hour. We're going to talk a lot about mockers and scoffers. Now, having said that, in fairness, there are uh, other brothers in scriptures that might be concerned. They might be listening to others. They're afraid to actually look at other scriptures. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to be deceived. You know, that sort of thing. And of course we don't. But that's why we're instructed to seek the Lord. Take it before the Lord. Seek his wisdom. Seek the, the discernment of the spirit and find out what that is. Don't close your eyes to the scripture because someone else has told you, no, no, no. If you do that, that's wrong. That is, I believe, that is such a serious mistake. The scripture is our sword, right? That's our sword. That's our weapon of warfare. That's the one offensive weapon that we have to fight the enemy. And how are you going to fight with a sword if you don't know how to use it, brothers and sisters? Oh my goodness, you gotta know how to use it. Get in that word. And, you know, God wants you to. Spirit will lead you. Spirit will lead you. As I'm getting back to, as a, sorry, I got off on that, on that side, but it's so important. And I feel Holy Spirit so strongly right now. Jinoka, she writes, sorry to bother you with something stupid. Now, first off, this is not something stupid. She feels that way. And that's what I'm saying. Many of you are going to understand exactly how she feels. But I felt prompted to reach out to you. I was in a good mood today. And until it was brought up by her dad or whomever, that how evil the media, how evil entertainment is, how uh, and others, how all of this has become so evil. She says, now I'm feeling depressed and I can't seem to throw off some of the spiritual attacks that have been coming at me nearly nonstop. And sister, this is what I'm telling you. I understand that. What does the word tell us? Be joyful, be glad when all of these things are happening to you because great is your reward in heaven, right? We know what is happening. When you're being attacked by the enemy, we're just about to get that breakthrough that we're waiting for, amen? All right, then she goes on. I'm tired, Wayne. Brothers and sisters, can, does that resonate with you? Are you tired? I can tell you, I'm tired too. But tired does not mean stop or quit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Get that second wind and let's get ready for this. Let's be watching for this, okay? I want to go home, but I refuse to use the way that drops into my skull right after refusing an attack. I won't do it. I won't. And we understand what that is. Don't let the enemy attack you. Put thoughts into your head. Tear down those imaginations. Tear down those strongholds. Renew your mind with that word of God. Get in there. Get into that word, right? Okay. The Lord is your strength. It's not you. It's not your strength. And if you're tired, if you're weary, it's not because of the Lord. It's because of the enemy. So if you are tired and we all are, it's because the enemy is attacking. That's why we need to draw closer, ever closer to the Lord Jesus, right? To be refreshed, to, to have that cleansing blood, to, to have the waters of refreshing, to have the spirit just bubbling up within us. The, do you understand what I'm saying? 
The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? All right. It says, I realize that you get a lot of mail, uh, both for life and work and from your ministry. Maybe I just needed to reach out to another in the body. I don't know. Regardless, feel free to ignore this. Dear sister, I'm not about to ignore it. And I am presenting this right now because there are so many of us that feel in the same boat, in the same way. And I'm going to lift you up and all of our brothers and sisters right now in prayer. Let's do that now. And I encourage everyone within the sound of my voice right now, join me in this prayer for your brothers, for your sisters, for the lost, and those that need Jesus. We're going to do that right now. Dear, dear Abba, our Heavenly Father, this is the time appointed. We know this is it, and the enemy is attacking so strongly. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, that you are going to fill the hearts, the minds, and the souls with yourself, fully, completely overflowing. Forgive us all of the, this daily trudge. Forgive us all of any thoughts that we might have of doubt, any thoughts that we might have of despair, because none of that, none of that is from you. It is from the enemy. And we're asking you, Holy Spirit, to just anoint everyone within the sound of our voices everyone that you hear us praying for, everyone that we are lifting up in prayer to let them know that you are right here. You are at the door. You are available to them at the calling, at the asking. Fill us to overflowing, I ask, Holy Spirit, in Jesus's name. Amen. Okay. 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 And I'm asking for you, please, listen to this message. Listen to this message because it will be an encouragement to you. All right. So what is the message basically about? It is about warnings. It is about this annular uh, ring of fire eclipse and appearing on the ring finger. I don't exactly know how it did that since there isn't a ring finger. Okay. Be that as it may, we can imagine that there is a ring finger and that this uh, graphic that is being used in Stellarium uh, for the, uh, the, the Virgin, Virgo, that uh, this annular eclipse, this ring of fire eclipse, which looks like a ring, uh, is uh, appearing at that spot, at that location, okay? Awesome, awesome stuff. Um, but there are, it's a warning. It's a warning. And it's a sign. Now, I want to be able to point out what we're talking about here. What are they signs for? What are we seeing? Because we are told to, when we see the things happening on the earth, that we are to look up and lift up our heads because our redemption draws near. Well, if we're looking up, if we're lifting up our heads, what are we going to see? We're going to see exactly these types of things happening in the heavens. And I think that is just amazing. Let me give you, but is that the only thing that's happening? Oh no, oh no. We are being, we are having different types of messages and different types of confirmations, different types of things to catch our attention individually and corporately, okay? And, and you will see these things. So like, just for example, I have just recently, I didn't know what I had to do on this, okay? I have my world clock, okay, on my iPhone. And this world clock, I have a number of different time zones 
from across the globe, okay? Um, and yes, I'm gonna call it a globe, guys. Sorry, just deal with me. Uh, and, uh, and so from all of these kinds of things, I, I, that's, that's what we are going to see. Now, I didn't know initially why I was prompted to add these different things in. Now, I can actually tell you, just let me just take a quick look here so I can kind of give you an idea before we go into this further. So in my world clock, because normally I would just look at my clock on the front of the phone. But for some reason here, as of late, I was prompted to look at the world clock. I didn't know why, but I did, of course. And I started to get my mind blown, okay? Now, people have been looking at times and, and seeing numbers and that sort of thing, okay? Well, so here's what I've got. Uh, I've got Jerusalem, which actually is the very first one in my list. Then Melbourne, Australia, which is where I am. That's second in the list. Then Dallas, because that's where I used to live for so many years there in Texas. Then I have London, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka, Beijing, uh, New York, Prague, Amsterdam, Shenyang in China. San Francisco is the very last one, which would be on the West Coast. Are you seeing me? Okay, now what is interesting about this I added them all at different times and it was just a progressive thing, right? So as any of you know that what I have been doing is I have shown how I would catch sight of this. Certain that people would see things like 1111 or 726 or 153. You're following me, okay? And we know, so what does that mean, okay? Well, they mean different things to us individually and other people can get to recognize them, right? So 726, I understand that for me, that's Strong's 726. That is the word harpazo. That is what we term the rapture of the bride, okay? 153 or 153 or the reverse or various different ways that we can pop that up. That's the great catch, which depending upon how you look at it can be, uh, can be the uh, uh, one of the perspective uh, looks for the rapture again, or the second harvest, or it, you following what I'm saying? So there's different things like that. All right. So I got on this world clock, okay? Uh, so here's the deal. Just this morning, just so you know, I have had now hundreds of these happening. I'm going to show you just what happened this morning as I was preparing to, uh, uh, to go live, okay? Now, I've just printed these out uh, just so you can kind of get an idea, and I will pop through and explain them to you, okay? Okay, hold on just a second here. Okay, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and take that out. You know, a little personal information we don't want there, uh, just for uh, protection. And because you have an email, if anybody wants to get a hold of me, you know that there is an email that's in the description box. And, uh, and so you can uh, go ahead and send me an email there. There's other people that, that have been uh, sending me emails, just like our, our sister here replied. Yeah, I do receive a lot of them. And sometimes I have to admit, especially as of late, it gets a little difficult to do that. But let me go ahead and show you what we have on here. So, okay. This is, the, uh, I hope you're going to be able to see this. Let's see. There we go. Okay. 
take a little snapshot of that. All right, and then on the back, because here's another one. So just go ahead and take a shot of that one, okay? All right, now let's cover what I'm seeing here. So the first thing this morning, and you see how I've got certain ones circled. Oh, wow. Beijing, New York. Uh, let's see. They're showing 717. And what is 717? That, just like Harpazo, is a plucking up, right? It's, it's very similar to the very same word, Harpazo, okay? It's meant to pluck up, to take up. So that's what I saw. Then you see in Amsterdam, it's 117, which is the division or the separation. Or you can also look at it as 711, right? Uh, seventh month, 11th day, right? Um, the uh, and, and so I see it that way. And then we've got Xinyang, 717. And I thought, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. So, so I highlighted that. Uh, and then uh, when you look at the other one, so you've got two images. One is because I couldn't put them all in one So because you, you have to scroll down for all. So you see in Melbourne, it's, 117 or the separation. And then, uh, of course, you've got Beijing, uh, which is 717 or being plucked up. So, so I'm seeing all of those. All oh, right. The separation, the plucking, the harvest. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Okay. Then you go down, and then I had another one. You see, it's 123, which is actually, I read it as 321. That's just for me as the countdown. Uh, and it says, ready, three, two, one, let's go, right? Love that from our brother there. And uh, so I see that when I always see that, it reminds me this is a countdown and it's counted down to the last number, okay? All right, so when we look on the back, then what do I find there? Oh, wow, just a few minutes later, but once again, bang, my mind is brought instantly to this. And I was just like, oh, my goodness, 726, uh, 726, 726, right? And uh, so we know that from the Strongs. And then I see on the other one, so it's a, a 654. Right, I see that as another countdown thing, right? Along with a seven, two, six, or a harpazo. Then later I get six, two, seven there in Dallas, which is seven, two, six, right? Harpazo. And then down, um, what do we see here? The very last one that I have listed for you is 458, 458. I'm 458, I'm 458, right? That stands for Elimelech, or God is King. And, and uh, after, after Jesus sang that song to me, and if you haven't heard that, if you're new to that, I encourage you to go back, ask anybody there, <coughs> excuse me, that's, on, uh, that's online right now, if you're on, you're like, 458, what does that mean? Okay, well, I can tell you, Jesus in a confirmatory dream told me, uh, I'm 458. Because I was asking for confirmation. Well, he sang it to me. And I thought it was funny, right? I thought, how strange is that, right? But then Holy Spirit prompted me to actually look that up. And I'm not much of a Strong's person necessarily, but I went ahead and did it. And that's what it said. So I was asking whether that dream was given by God. And well, he told me exactly. I'm 458. God is king. Amen. I knew it was him. There was no question from that point. Okay. 
And so where am I going with this? Well, for me, that was a lot of things. So I've had dreams, visions, little things that are pointed out to show us out how we are so close, how everything is just speeded up, speeded up, speeded up to critical mass as, as I would like to look at it, okay? All right, but did it always start that way? No, no, it's been ever increasing. And, and, and I wanna go all the way back to when Israel became a nation or, excuse me, in 1948, excuse me, let me take a quick drink. Ah, thank you, Baba. All right. Ah, he's so gracious. He gives us everything far above and beyond what we can ask or imagine. Amen. All right. Uh, and so the reason why I just go back there, well, for years and years before that, we knew there was prophecy and we were kind of forward looking, but there wasn't a lot of prophetic events that we could see taking place that we could relate to the scripture. Okay. There were some, you know, and you could see some and you could kind of point to some forward looking things and see, oh, I can kind of see over there that might, that could go that way, you know, that kind of deal. But there was no question in anybody's mind that when Israel became a nation on May 14, 1948, bam, there's prophecy. Whoa, who saw that coming? No, not a lot of people did, right? But then suddenly the prophetic eyes of people who are in the word of God are saying like, oh, 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 that's it. That is prophecy fulfilled. And you would have a hard time trying to be able to say otherwise. Uh, you can be a mocker or a scoffer. And you can say, well, ah, it doesn't have anything to do with that. But you would be hard pressed to find anybody today that would actually say, no, 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 that didn't mean that at all. That's not prophecy fulfilled. Of course it was. Now, at that point, okay, so you have a nation are there other things that are happening? Well, there's some tussles, we can see that, but not, and, and some uh, earthquakes that we can see starting to increase in uh, frequency that we hadn't had as much before. And so you can see that and you start, start to think, well, does that relate to Matthew chapter 24? What, what do we see? You understand where I'm going with this? Okay. Then just quickly jump uh, to the end of this. Then we started seeing things from across the world where potential prophetic events were being established or fulfilled, uh, depending upon how you read the scriptures several times in a year. When we're thinking like, my goodness, where, where once there was a dearth of what we understood to be prophetic events. And now, wow, we got several things to look for in a year. Well, let's get down to today. We are seeing prophetic events throughout a 24 hour period. And that is what I'm contending today. And there's more and more of them. And, and, and so we have so many people now that have dreams, visions, uh, warnings from God, visitations uh, from uh, Jesus, Holy Spirit, afterlife experiences such as the ones that I have had in where you uh, uh, people have died and met Jesus. Uh, it, it, all of this, it's not by chance uh, how different religious uh, folks, uh, they encounter Jesus either in a dream or what they, they're not sure of what that is but it has such a profound uh, impact on them that they leave their, what I consider is a false religion for the true religion, or should I say 
true relationship with Jesus. Amen? All right. So that's what we have going on. Well, do I have anything that's going to help us today to kind of point this out? And I think I do. So here is what I want to point out first about, uh, we know in Acts chapter 2, we have a uh, Peter's sermon, and we're going to cover that later, where, well, actually, let me give you a little bit of a, a preview here. We're going to cover it in deeper detail, but I want to focus on one particular area, all right? And uh, so Peter says, after there's a bunch of mocking and scoffing, that's going to be another point, which actually is a sign. I want you to listen to this. That's actually a sign, okay? So uh, Peter says, when everyone is filled with the Spirit, they're being mocked and being told because they're speaking in, in other tongues that uh, they're drunk with wine, okay? And so what does Peter say? He says that they're not drunk, as you suppose, but this is the beginning of, now I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified Bible, because I think that there are some certain things that really kind of bring out the Greek emphasis in certain words. And, uh, and so I want to focus on that. I have nothing, of course, I have nothing but uh, uh, the greatest of respect for the King James. I'm only wanting to get down deeper into the Greek for our English speaking uh, brothers and sisters, okay? And he says, these people are not drunk as you assume, since it is only the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m. But this is the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be, in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind. All mankind, folks, listen up. Not just Jewish folks, not just Christian folks, but all mankind. And your sons and daughters, there we go, okay, that relates, they shall prophesy. And your young men shall see divinely prompted visions. And your old men shall dream divinely prompted dreams. I call them God dreams. And that's what I, I, I have no other way of calling them, but I know they're from God, right? And so that's what I call them, God dreams. But this is what it points out. They are divinely prompted, okay? Uh, even on my bond servants, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will bring about wonders in the sky above and signs or attesting miracles on the earth below, blood and fire and smoking vapor. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. Now, I'm going to stop right there, okay? I'm going to highlight, as I pointed out, the difference in what's going to happen. I think it's very important that we see that what he says is, but this is, in the King James, it says, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. But this, then I thought, like, this really gives you a deeper understanding, but this is the beginning of what was spoken of through the prophet Joel, okay? And so what uh, the prophet Joel was saying was all of these things are going to occur, the beginning all through to the end. And it's interesting that the way that that prophecy is ending is the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. So here is the beginning of that here in Acts with the pouring out of Holy Spirit. All right. All the way through, 
So you then, bang, here is fulfilling prophecy that's going to continue and, and, and continue to be revealed and opened up all to the very end, right? And where does it stop? The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Does it say on the day that the Lord comes? No, it says before the great and glorious day of the Lord comes. What is that telling us? That is telling us, brothers and sisters, that it's a warning. When you have these warnings or signs, they portend a future coming event. Now, that future may be very short, right? You understand? But what, what the point is, <clears throat> it doesn't say that, all right, you know, when you see everything turn to darkness, bang, that's when it happens, right? Do we have any evidence of that? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I would say that the answer is no. Or at least let me clarify. From what I've seen out of scripture and what uh, has been revealed to me thus far, I don't see that as being the case. But this is very interesting. I want to equate, I would like to equate what I think could be something very eye-opening. And that is this October 14th. Uh, wedding ring eclipse, that that is an end marking warning sign, an impending sign for what is just about to take place. Now, do we have this anywhere else where I can see that? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because we just saw in uh, out of the prophet uh, prophecy from Joel that or Joel, if you're from the South, like I am, uh, that what, what's going on here is that it's the beginning of a fulfillment of something, a, a excuse me, a series of events, right? All right. So you see where it's building from. Wow, you've got people prophesying, having dreams, the spirit is being poured out. There's a testing signs in the skies. And all of this is before that day. So they are meant to be warnings. I want to go ahead and equate this uh, as well with, uh, with a text out of the Synoptic Gospels that I think that you're going to be very interested in. Uh, here is what it is. Oh, thank you, anti-evil. Uh, they say, easy to see that Brother Wayne is nothing but a bundle of pure love. That's why I listen to him. We know this love only comes from God. Well, I, I appreciate that. I want you to know that I love you. You guys, all of you, brothers, sisters, even people who don't yet believe, I truly do. I want you to be able to have a taste of what I've had to taste of. And, and the only way I can do this and the way that I want to show you this type of love is through what I'm doing. I'm wanting to teach you this. I want you to check it out on your own. Check it out on your own, okay? Jesus loves you more than you could possibly imagine and we need to be a light to all those around us, especially now. The bride loves the bridegroom and we need other people to see that, okay? All right, so thank you very much for that and, and show love to each other. That's what this is all about, brothers and sisters. All right, <clears throat> pardon me. All right. Um, so here is what we're going to do is we're going to get into this word. And what I'm going to focus on right now is the eclipse, right? Because that's something that we can actually pull out and we can see it as being a warning. Okay. 
Now, there's going to be other things that I think that we're going to see here. This is something that's going to be maybe a miraculous sign, but wait, let's get into this and you're going to see where I'm going with this. I'm going to read you this little section out of Wikipedia first, and then we're going to go in and read it at a deeper context because there's some things I want to show you. All right. This is and because it, and as well as keep your ears open to and listen for the differences that you are going to hear between the Luke uh, gospel, the Mark gospel, and the Matthew gospel. Now understand that I'm taking it from a standpoint where the Luke, the gospel of Luke, is written to the audience of the bride of Christ. It's written to the bride. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Thank you, Abba. And the gospel of Mark is written to the left behind main body of the church. Okay. Now, I know that there's going to be a bunch of people that initially they immediately bristled when I say that. Just if you would just listen um, and because you're going to find uh, if, if you're willing to listen, have a teachable spirit, take it before the Lord to see if this is true. Right. And that's what you do. That's what you do. I'm not asking you to take my word on it. I'm asking you just be willing to listen and then take it to the Lord. OK, OK. Uh, and then, of course, we have the book of Matthew, and that's what I contend is written to an audience, which is the remnant Jews that will become believers at the end of the tribulation period. OK. All right. There I have. I don't know how many messages and where I cover this in detail. And there are others that are finally coming on board to this. Um and I'm glad to, to be able to see that. But I cover this saying that there are effectively three harvests. And you, you can call them, an, uh, I, I call them rapture slash harvest slash gathering events, right? Uh, I prefer the term harvest because in each instance, the bride is harvested. The barley, that's there, it, it, it's under the agricultural paradigm. Then there are three groups, and they are representative as a different type of harvest. And each group is harvested at a different time. And, uh, and so the barley harvest, which I think equates to the bride of Christ, that is the first harvest or first rapture, if you will. Okay. Now there's, there's some differences as far as different words, just like I was pointing out earlier, how 717 actually means to pluck up, to take away, right? Very similar to harpazo, which is to seize, to snatch, same type of situation going on. Um, and, and so I would rather, for simplicity's sake, that we look at it from the harvest paradigm. And let's not try to isolate different types because there's going to be three different harvests. And I think that, so there's going to be the uh, the bride, which is harvested pre-trib. There is the mid-tribulation, depending upon where you want to look at that in there. I'm not establishing a specific day, but I can tell you where there's a cutoff, and that's the mid-tribulation. Uh, there's going to be the harvest, the main harvest, the greater harvest, the wheat harvest. That happens at that particular time. And then at the end of the tribulation, there is a grape harvest or a fruit harvest. It's, 
It's after the wrath in which there are the grapes of wrath, if you will. And that happens at the end of the tribulation. And that would be the remnant Jews. Now they are not raptured vertically, but I believe that we have uh, enough scripture to be able to say that they are raptured, translated, snatched, moved in location horizontally, just like the cross, right? You've got the cross where you've got the vertical part, and then you've got the horizontal part. And, uh, and so that's what I think. So just like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch as an example, where Holy Spirit translates Philip from there back into the city in, uh, in Jerusalem, the area there. Okay. And so that's a miraculous translation, but not to heaven, right? Because that's where uh, the bride and that's where the body will go. Uh, but the, and all of those that die in the Lord will uh, receive a resurrection and happen at that point, okay? Uh, there's so much more to this. I hope that just gives you just a simple synopsis of the way that I'm looking at it, kind of a summary. And then we can go in here and look at how this relates to the solar eclipse where everyone was just so focused on it. All right, I'm gonna read out of uh, Matthew 27. And verse 45, so I'm just going to read a little snippet first, and then we're going to go into it deeper, okay? This is what it says about, this is from the Wikipedia, the text of the Gospel of Matthew reads, From noon on, darkness came over the whole land, or earth, until three in the afternoon. The author includes dramatic details following the death of Jesus, including an earthquake, and the raising of the dead, which were also common motifs in Jewish apocalyptic literature. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. The Gospel of Mark concurs with the timing of events, stating that on preparation day, the eve of the Sabbath, Jesus was crucified at, quote, the sixth hour, unquote, or around noon, and darkness fell over all the land, or all the world. The Greek uh, gen can mean either, okay? So keep that in mind. From around noon, the sixth hour until three o'clock, the ninth hour. It adds, immediately after the death of Jesus, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, but does not mention an earthquake or opening of tombs. Bing, 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 difference. Okay. Then we go to the Gospel of Luke, concurs with the length and timing of the darkness but also does not mention an earthquake or the opening of the tombs. Contrary to Matthew or Mark, however, the text mentions the tearing of the temple veil prior to the death of Jesus. Bing, 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 okay? And provides the obscuring of the sun as the cause of the darkness. It was now about noon. Now, you notice it doesn't say it was exactly noon, right? And darkness came over the whole land or whole earth until three in the afternoon while the sun's light failed or the sun was eclipsed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, it's in, as an interesting point here, I'll go ahead and add it says it appears that Luke may have originally explained the event as a miraculous solar eclipse. And I agree. 
The majority of mans uh, manuscripts of the Gospel of Luke have the Greek phrase ekkostia ho helios, which means the sun was darkened. But the earliest manuscripts say tau helio eclipontos, the sun's light failed or the sun was in eclipse. However, a total eclipse provides darkness at one location during the or totality for a maximum or of seven and a half minutes. Whereas the gospel text state that the darkness covered the land for roughly three hours. For this reason, one early Christian commenter suggested that the early text attributing the event to an eclipse had been deliberately corrupted by opponents of the church to make it easier to attack on naturalist grounds. And I also concur with that, okay? Now, we, so there are those that, okay, are we talking about an actual eclipse like we're talking about? Yes, now, yes. However, we're also to, uh, talking about this darkness as it relates to this moment. And we're also talking about a miraculous event that's equated with this time. And that is the rapture of the bride, right? Okay. Now, I want to give you, if, if you'll follow with me, some greater insight into how this works, right? I'm going to start with Matthew and work in reverse, okay? Matthew written to the remnant Jewish believers. Now, I'm going to read, I'm going to uh, read out of Matthew chapter 27, and I'm going to start at verse 27 because I need to give you this, uh, excuse me, this context. Matthew chapter 27, as I mentioned before, I'm going to read out of the Amplified. It says, Jesus is mocked. This is a big point because I want you to know that, right? <clears throat> You're going to see this and how it relates to now. Verse 27 then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the uh, praetorium and they gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him as a king's robe. Now, if you've seen uh, some of my other messages, uh, there's so many differences between the synoptic gospels that are, are they are they contradictions? No, they're not. They are truths and they are written specifically for the purpose of identifying a specific group that they are written to, an audience for the specific group. Now, if there's anyone saying that I'm uh, that you should only read one. No, 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 no. Of course not. I'm not saying that at all. All scripture was written for our admonition, right? for teaching and, and everything that Timothy was talking about, edification, building up the man of God. That's, we want, that is for all of that. But specifically, these particular gospels were written to a specific audience. They were written to a particular group, but they were written for everyone. They're examples for us, you follow me? All right, so it's important that we see that. All right, uh, so we're not going to discuss a bunch of the other differences, but I want to focus on this particular message on the mocking and the darkness, okay? There's a reason for that. All right, they stripped him down as a king's robe. And so we know also this, this is all the Roman soldiers that's doing this, okay? After twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand as a scepter. And, and you note that not a lot of uh, mention of that is made. They, they put the crown of thorns on his head, but right now, because obviously he can't hold that reed when he's nailed to the cross, but they were doing it to mock him as a king. 
And uh, it says, kneeling before him, they ridiculed him or mocked him, saying, hail or rejoice, king of the Jews. They spat on him and took the reed and struck him repeatedly on the head. After they finished ridiculing him, they stripped him of the scarlet robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. So that's why we don't hear, why don't we hear any mention of the scarlet robe here? Did that mean that he wasn't in a scarlet robe? No, we see right here what happened. He had a scarlet robe on him in this letter that's written to the unbelieving Jews right? Okay, that will be believing Jews to show he was the Messiah. That's the whole point. All right. But there's different audiences that's written over here, so you're going to see differences. Anyway, all right, let's continue. Um, now, this is verse 32. Now, as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they forced into service to carry the cross of Jesus. Ooh, he didn't want to do that, did he? He was forced to do it, so he did it, you know, that sort of thing. That, and so that's the point here. But let's get into the crucifixion. And when they came to the, a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine mixed with gall or myrrh, a bitter tasting narcotic, to drink. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among them by casting lots. Then sitting down there, they began to keep watch over him to guard against any rescue attempt. And above his head, they put the accusation against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Now, this is where I want you to perk up. Please pay attention here, starting in verse 38. At the same time, two robbers were crucified with Jesus, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by were hurling abuse at him and jeering at him wagging their heads in scorn and ridicule. And they said tauntingly, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself from death. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, now you notice that we're all, that's two different groups of people that we're talking about right now. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, he saved others from death. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down off of the cross, and we will believe in him and acknowledge him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him also began to insult him in the same way. Now, this is the, the big uh, important part that I want to see. So you see at, there's three groups right at this particular point in Matthew, and all are mocking him, right? Now, from the sixth hour, noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with an agonized voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders there heard it, they began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and took a sponge, soaked it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest said, 
let us see whether Elijah will come to save him from death. And Jesus cried out again with a loud agonized voice and gave up his spirit voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. And at once, the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split apart. The tombs were opened and many bodies of the saints, God's people who had fallen asleep in death were raised to life. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. And then finally, verse 54. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, they were terribly frightened and filled with awe and said, truly, this was the son of God. Mm, mm, mm. Yes, truly, he is the son of God. So that's very interesting. So you see in out of all of this, there is mocking that takes place. Then he's crucified. And while he is on the cross, well, he's on the cross, okay? So all of the preparatory stuff and all the mocking and scoffing, there wasn't darkness then. It happened when he was on the cross. So we then know that it was for three hours. So it had to be something miraculous, right? Uh, we just see in here that it was over all of the land or over all of the earth. I have a strong suspicion, just like the rapture of the bride will take place, taking his bride from all of the earth, that this darkness was also all over the earth, okay? All right, so what is the difference here when we look at the gospel of Mark? Well, let me just start here. <clears throat> I'm going to read again from the Amplified Bible in all of these instances. This is out of Mark chapter 15. And, um, and I'm going to start with Jesus is mocked. All right. Starting at verse 16, the soldiers led him away into the place that is the praetorium. And they called together the entire Roman battalion of 600 soldiers. They dressed him up in a ranking Roman officer's robe of purple. Do you already see this different? And look at this, right? He is the Lord of hosts, right? He is the Lord of all of the armies of heaven. And here they are mockingly at the same time showing that he is uh, their commander. It, it, he's over them. It, it's just amazing to me. Okay. Um, but there's 600 soldiers. And how often have we actually looked at that? Not a lot of people look at that, right? Think about this. Look at this picture and see what you've got. And I remember when I was in my afterlife uh, experience, and I was on my way to Jesus and I was in this tunnel and 360 degrees, it's surrounded by all of these military angels. And that's what, and they were, they were excited for me. I was coming through to be with Jesus and they were lining the way like this procession, this great military procession. It was so awesome. I encourage you, if you haven't heard my testimony, please check that out. It, it, it never stops even just mentioning it. How amazing, how amazing was it? And the honor, the respect, 
that I was experiencing from them and I could, I could feel it. I, I knew that's what that was. And yes, these angels had wings. So for those that just got to think that no, angels don't have wings. Yeah, they can. They can. Uh, I'm telling you they can. The scripture says that they can. So, and, uh, and so anyway, that aside, that's what I'm saying. I can see the contrast between this military procession where we are going to be with Jesus and we are going to be married, joined with, in union with Jesus. And where does it say? He says, I'm going to make those who uh, uh, claim that they are Jews and are not. Am I getting this the right one? Uh, and he said, I will uh, have those. It's either those or your enemies. They are going to uh, bow down before you. Uh, he will make, this is the one I'm thinking of. He will make your enemies, your, uh, your footstool. They will be a footstool for that. So they're actually a footstool for Jesus, but we're filled with Jesus. We're united with Jesus. So they're actually going to be our footstool too, right? That's what they're going to be. They're going to be bowed down, right? Anyway, so that's an aside. Um, so they, let's see, let's get back to this. They dressed him in a ranking Roman officer's robe of purple. And after twisting together a crown of thorns, they placed it on him. And they began saluting and mocking him. Hail, King of the Jews. They kept beating him on the head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling and bowing in mock homage to him. After they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out of the city to crucify him. In uh, verse 21, they forced into service a passerby coming in from the countryside, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. The crucifixion, they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. They tried to give him mixed wine with myrrh to dull the pain, but he would not take it. And they crucified him and divided up his clothes amongst themselves, casting lots for them to see who should take what. Verse 25, it was the third hour, 9 a.m., when they crucified him. The inscription of the accusation against him had been written above him, the king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on the right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says he was counted with the transgressors. Those who were passing by were insulting him with abusive and insolent language, wagging their heads as a sign of contempt and saying, ha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in only three days, save yourself by coming down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also along with the scribes were ridiculing and mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others from death. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ the Messiah, the anointed, the King of Israel, now come down from the cross so that we may see and believe and trust in him. Those who were crucified with him were also insulting him. Verse 33, when the sixth hour, noon, came, darkness covered the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m., and at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders heard him and said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him a drink saying, let us see whether Elijah is coming to take him down. 
But Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed out his last, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. And the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, being fully in control, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Notice those differences and the way the difference is. This is written to the left behind church, okay? Many, many differences there, but I want you to focus again on the mocking, the darkness, and the way this ends, okay? All right, now, at the, for this last one, this is out of Luke chapter 23, all right? And uh, I'm going to uh, put this together in the same way. So you now notice how in Mark, how they forced Simon the Cyrene to bear his cross. But we didn't have any information uh, on it from that point, right? But this is very interesting when you look at it from the standpoint of the bride that sees all of this. Simon bears the cross, starting at verse 26 of Luke chapter 23. When they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming to the city from the country and placed on him the cross to carry behind Jesus. Following him was a large crowd of people, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. But Jesus, turning toward them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that have not given birth and the breasts that have never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be executed with him, the crucifixion. When they came to a place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his clothes amongst themselves. Now the people stood by watching, but even the rulers ridiculed and sneered at him, saying, He saved others from death. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him and cruelly offering him sour wine and sarcastically saying, If you are really the king of the Jews, Save yourself from death. Now there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals that had been hanging on the cross beside him kept hurling abuse at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us from death. But the other one rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We are suffering justly because we're getting what we deserve for what we have done. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise. Verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour, noon. 
and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Because the sun was obscured and the veil of the Holy of Holies of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had taken place, he began praising and honoring God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. All the crowds who had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had happened, began to return to their homes. <coughs> Excuse me. One more drink. I want you to recognize the three groups here, folks. All the crowds who had gathered for this spectacle, when they saw what had happened, began to return to their homes, beating their breasts as a sign of mourning and repentance. Verse 49. And all his acquaintances and the women who had accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance watching these things. Now, I find that very interesting. What I see here, one of the things that that really caught my attention, obviously, there are many things that we look at. But in verse 47, I see this as a an example of the Gentile uh, uh, bride. And so it, this is it. Why? Why do I see that? Because there, uh, the, the Gentile Romans, right, they had, he, he, they had crucified him, but they recognized who he was and then began praising and honoring God, recognized this, certainly this man was innocent. When he saw what had taken place, now what's interesting here, what he saw, or what I'm saying the Gentile bride saw, was all of this. He said when all of this had taken place, right? He'd seen all of this. He recognized exactly who Jesus was. But you have the second group, the crowds that had gathered for this spectacle. That's the left behind. And it's the same thing that when we look at Elijah and Elisha, or Elisha, just for simplicity, so that you can understand the difference. Uh, Elijah, and we have uh, Elisha is watching this all take place, right? He's left behind. Elijah is taken up. He's left behind. And what does he do? He rips his clothes in grief. And cries out, my father, my father, right? He sees what had happened. And now he goes back. He takes up the mantle that falls from Elijah. And he goes back into, uh, into the town. And, uh, and, of course, slapping uh, the Jordan, it splits and he begins his ministry there. So I see the very same thing here, right? We see the first group, the Gentiles, recognizing in out of everything exactly who Jesus is. And then all of the crowds who had gathered, verse 48, for this spectacle, right? They see it. They're, 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 they're seeing the spectacle of Jesus on the cross, right? And it says, when they saw what happened, began to return. What is What do we call repentance, right? We call that a returning, right? Turn around. Go back to where you came from, right? To their homes, beating their breast as a sign of mourning and repentance. Because that's going to happen when the bride is taken pre-trib. When the bride goes and they see this spectacle, will that be a spectacle? You know it will be. What a spectacle. And they are then going to go back, just like Elisha, or Elisha, is going to go back 
they are going to be in grief and mourning, but they're going to go back to their homes and they are going to start this awesome uh, uh, wheat harvest preparation. They are going to be filled with a double portion of his spirit. I hope that you will check those out. But then we've got this remnant, right? What is the remnant? And all his acquaintances who were with him and the, uh, the women that had accompanied him. So they were a group that knew him by name only. Interesting. They're Jewish by name only. And they were at a distance watching these things. They'll believe at the end. All right, brothers and sisters, I hope that you see. So the, what does that mean that's going to happen now? We have so many mockers and scoffers when we're talking about, oh, Jesus is going to be coming. And here we're looking for him and everything else. They're mocking, they're scoffing, just like what happened before the spectacle took place. And, and, and so we see that out of the, the prophet Joel, how that progression of things takes place. And they are warnings. What did Jesus do? He gave them a warning. I find it interesting. Can we relate that maybe the darkness was the warning, just like he told the daughters of Jerusalem that don't, don't worry for me. This is what you need to worry about, right? And, uh, and there's going to be a time that's going to be coming during the great tribulation when they... Um, they call for the mountains to fall on us and hide us from the face of the, him that sits on the throne. We know that's going to happen and take place then. It's going to be a terrible time. But those ones will talk about it only. Okay. Uh, so we've got Bob saying KJV only. Well, I, I disagree. You know, I, I if, if, if you think that... Um, that you can't learn anything else uh, or that you can't find any uh, deeper. I, I don't know why you would not want to look to be able to compare words and things like this. I don't know why you would want to do that. I actually want to know my Jesus in a greater, deeper way. I want to know these little things. Those words in the KJV are great, but to say that I'm going to use them only, that's that's really kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face, considering that they were written in Greek and Hebrew. So I like to look at the Greek and the Hebrew. And, uh, and then I don't have to worry about any ambiguity that we have in the English language, uh, which we do have. If you speak English, I hope you understand that there's a lot more ambiguity than there is in Greek. So I encourage you to be able to check this out. Um, and, uh, and but if you are reading the KJV and you're reading it, you're actually reading it, then bless you, bless you. It's good for you. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm going to continue just to be able to uh, try to give you a, what I contend is a deeper understanding what this message is trying to say. The mockers are coming. No man knows the day or the hour. Look at this. Ha ha ha. You said that and, and so on and so forth. Don't look at that. Or the, everything's a deception of the enemy. No, many will come in my name saying I am Christ. That's what you're not supposed to be deceived by, right? Uh, it doesn't say that anytime someone says something about the word that, well, you're being deceived. That is not understanding what the word of God is saying right? Be teachable. Be teachable. I encourage you to look. Look, pray, seek discernment, and be looking up in the sky because he is about to take us home. We just had a warning, and that warning is showing us that we are clearly, when you look at Joel's prophecy, we're at the end of the end. It's about to take place. Don't give up hope. We're right there. Hold on, brothers and sisters. God bless you all, and I'll see you in the clouds. And before I go, I want to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, 
If you don't know this Jesus that I've been talking about today, God, very God that came down in a body of a man named Jesus, he was died, cruelly killed on a cross for your sin and my sin. And he was buried and after three days he rose again and he gives you that free gift. He paid for it and then gives you that free gift. And all you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is accept it. Do that now if you have it. I pray that you will. Time is short. You don't want to be here. You don't want to be left behind. I love you all. God bless you. Maranatha.